Hello everyone, um, my name is Jenny Bund, Head of Archives Research at the National Archives and I would like to welcome you back to day two of our Archive Supporting Environmental Sustainability event. We're delighted to have so many of you join us again today and also to welcome some new faces. On Monday the talks were about reflecting, looking back at some of the great work that has already been done and celebrating the networks and support that are already in place. Today we will look at the many different perspectives that we need to be considered and after the break at some um, concrete examples of how we can work together and take action now. So we're beginning today with a long table. We have four fantastic speakers, all of whom bring different perspectives on environmental sustainability to the table. They will share their thoughts and reflections for five minutes each before we then open the discussion to you, the audience, as we are also keen to hear your perspectives. So we've posted a link to the event Padlet in the chat, which contains some of the questions we are considering today. And thank you to those of you who have shared your thoughts there already. We encourage you to continue to share those thoughts with us today during this long table. Please continue to add your thoughts to the Padlet, or if you want to join the discussion in person after our speakers have presented, please raise your hand and one of our team members will then enable you to turn on your camera and microphone so that you can join the discussion on screen. You can also use the chat to share your thoughts and questions. Um, and I would ask you not to use the Q&A for this session, but to actually put your questions in the chat. Um, and this is obviously because we are keen to make this session um, more discursive in nature and has nothing to do whatsoever with the fact that as chair, I find it quite difficult monitoring Q&A and chat simultaneously. So without further ado, we're going to introduce the speakers for this morning's session. Um, as our speakers will be sharing their own perspectives, I don't wish to sort of frame them or speak for them in any way. So I'm going to introduce them very, very briefly. Um, first to speak will be William Kilbride, Executive Director at the Digital Preservation Coalition. William will be followed by Laura Boone, who is the Contemporary Curator of Maritime at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. After Laura, we will hear from May Kassar, CBE, Director of the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage. And last, but by no means least, um, May will be followed by Mark Sullivan, Estates Operations Manager at the National Archives. So I'm going to hand over immediately to William and switch my camera off. See you soon. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Jenny. It's over to me, five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be invited to speak to you this morning. I want to thank the organisers at the National Archives, Jenny and colleagues, for their efforts in bringing us together uh, for this timely, long overdue discussion. Uh, I have five minutes, so we'll attempt five themes in my five minutes. And I'm going to start in my own area of digital preservation. That's the series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as necessary. There are bits to emphasise here which will frame some of what will follow. It's a series of things, not an event. It fits within a policy framework. It's a bit more than backup and it's for as long as necessary, not forever and certainly not everything. Data life cycles are short, digital life cycles are short, so lots of agencies which are not archives in the traditional sense have a digital preservation problem. So it's not just for archives. Now on the face of it, digital preservation might sound like keeping lots of things, and that sounds energy intensive. And that would be true if you did it badly. Digital preservation is also about keeping control over the digital estate and creating permission to dispose, what to get rid of and when. So I am saying that a digital preservation strategy provides an informed and sustainable basis for reducing an organization's data footprint and by extension, carbon consumption too. So digital preservation is a green option. As an aside, there are particular challenges associated with preserving climate data, as well as long range scientific data related to the climate crisis. Perhaps we can get into that during the conversation. But considering the large numbers involved, you might be tempted to think of data storage as the carbon intensive bit of digital preservation. It doesn't have to be, especially if energy can be drawn from renewables. There are some good and some very bad practices in the management of data centres. And it mostly boils down to whether or not you trust the claims that cloud service providers make about their energy consumption. Remember also that 
every touch point of a preservation workflow requires some energy. Ingest, fixed three checking, migration and access. So as well as reducing the data volumes, we need to ask how many times a file needs to be checked for integrity. We need to question the assumption of large scale format migration and normalization and the carbon costs of storing and processing uncompressed files. We need to ask whether instant access, which means often spinning disks, is always the best solution. Nearline or offline storage is less good for users, but much healthier for the planet. I want to also step back a little from the details of digital preservation and give something of an historical perspective too. Remember that digital preservation emerged in the mid 90s in response to the widespread adoption of home computers and then the internet. The social and economic forces that, prevailed, that propelled that digital shift also created the climate crisis. Our work is symptomatic of accelerating cycles of innovation and disruption that lock us into short life cycle technologies and disposable infrastructures. One might call this obsolescence as a service. So think of digital preservation as an insurgency against deeply embedded forces which sit behind technology, a kind of obsolescence rebellion against non-renewable consumption, if I may. A pivot to sustainable long-term thinking in the technology sector would transform the digital preservation challenge. And that would be no bad thing. As with digital preservation, so with the climate crisis, short-term thinking serves no one in the long term. I'm dithering. My, my point is that the climate crisis will impact almost every aspect of our lives. It's possible, in fact, we should take for granted that we have unsustainable assumptions embedded into our professional practice and our institutions. The climate crisis will challenge these and we need to be ready for the disruption that will follow. Finally, to the DPC, I will freely admit our own work on green issues has been too sketchy for too long. I spoke to the IPRES conference about this uh, issue in 2010, but it was to an empty room and it didn't occur to us to include carbon cost into the cost models or risk models we've developed over the years since. But we've now written environmental impacts into the DPC rapid assessment model and our new strategic plan will explicitly commit us to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Nonetheless, I worry that we've yet to come close to the seriousness of this crisis. The news this morning uh, from a mile or so down the road here in Glasgow is pretty bleak. It's hinted that world leaders will need to meet again early next year because the COP process is failing. Analysis points to a deadly 2.7 degree increase in global temperatures, way above the 1.5 degrees proposed in Paris. As with the climate crisis, so with digital preservation, we have a relatively simple choice. To act in earnest, with courage now, or throw our hands in the air and hope that something will come along. To be an ancestor, or be a good ancestor. That's an easy choice. Thank you, William. Thank you. That's great. Um, long term thinking and questioning practice I'm getting. I'm writing my notes as we go along, but I will now pass over, if I may, to Laura. Um, Laura, I know you want to share your screen. So if you want to put that up now, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, good morning. Hopefully everyone can now see my presentation. My name's Laura um, and often when I tell people that I'm the contemporary curator at the Maritime Museum, they're a little surprised as the terms contemporary and maritime aren't two words that they um, would commonly think of, of going together. However, I passionately believe that maritime museums have a really important role to play in engaging um, people with the important topics of ocean sustainability and how we can protect our ocean going forward. Um, now, one of the ways that we can do this is opening up our collections to non-heritage researchers. Um, a really great example of this um, is that it's little known, but the very first um, studies that were able to show that climate change were happening actually used um, ship logs um, that charted data 
um, of weather in the 19th century. Um, our, likewise, many of our maps have been used by researchers to show the changes in species distribution um, over time due to um, exploitation and um, through fishing. Now, I know everyone here today will have very different um, collections um, within their institutions. However, I challenge you to look at them again with fresh eyes and see how your collections could be useful in better understanding our changing world. There's a huge number of diverse projects happening. For example, there's one that's using often forgotten oil paintings of uh, marketplace scenes to show how there's been a change in the abundance and species of fish over time. We can also look at how we can um, interpret our objects. Um, is there a problem with sound for everyone or just one person, sorry? You are a little bit shaky, Laura. When this happened last time, if you would mind switching off your camera, that sometimes improves yeah. it. So that would be great. Thank you. Great. Um, I'll try and speak up and slower and hopefully that will help. And um, we can also look at how we change our um, narratives. So the museum's largest object is the Cutty's Ark. And often the stories that we tell about it have focused on its heyday um, as a, a tea clipper. However, by broadening the narrative and putting it into its broader place in history, we can tell the really important story that's relevant today. As the shipping industry faces the challenge of transitioning to net zero, it's really important that they understand where they've come from so they can understand where they can go. Within just a generation, we moved from ships like the Cutty's Ark, which were basically carbon neutral, they were using sail power, to the very fossil fuel intensive industry that we know today. Now, to many people, shipping doesn't feel that relevant to our day to day life. Um, however, 85% of all the goods that are coming into the UK are still coming by ship, and it's a major contributor to greenhouse gases. Uh, now, as well as looking um, internally at our own collections, it's also really important that we engage with the world around us. Um, people's perception of the ocean is often now being looked at through the vision of uh, sustainability. And in 2019, we saw the rapid growth of people protesting on the streets, often motivated by their concerns around ocean sustainability. Extinction Rebellion quickly grew um, in less than a year to an organization that was seeing hundreds of thousands of people protesting on the street. Um, and they used the iconic boat, um, this pink one, to block um, Oxford Circus. We began to check with them um, and they were grassroots organizations. They weren't necessarily set up for engaging with museums about whether or not we could acquire this boat. Um, it's a very long story um, and it's detailed a little bit more in the contemporary collecting uh, toolbox, but um, fundamentally we, we failed. But it was a really useful exercise as a museum. It challenged perceptions within the museum itself as to how we should work, what we should be engaging with, it was initially quite divisive, um, but due to the legal issues around the boat, we were ultimately unsuccessful. Um, so although we failed, it was it was definitely worth doing. Um, and with uh, it actually ended up being a good test run for just a few weeks later in July when Extinction Rebellion suddenly had these five boats. Um, the blue Polly Higgins boat was used in London to protest about making ecocide law. Um, <clears throat> we still had an ongoing relationship with Extinction Rebellion, although it had been unsuccessful. Um, and we had very gentle discussions with them at the beginning of the week that we might be interested in displaying the boat later that summer. However, on the Friday, everything changed. Um, the Met Police had applied successfully for Section 12, which made the use of the boat illegal. Um, and it had been moved um, and was waiting to be seized by the police. So we had the option that we needed to collect the boat straight away um, or we would be unable to play it at all. The museum um, snapped into action. By the lunchtime, we were in central London examining it to see if it was safe to move. Um, and we agreed with the police that they were willing to hand it over to the museum as a loan object from Extinction Rebellion um, on the Friday of having a police escort all the way back 
to the museum. Just 19 days later, we were then able to display it um, to the public. It's a really great conversation piece around both environmental protest um, and the climate emergency. Really interestingly, this otherwise normally kind of unloved bit of the museum law, lawn became a place of relevance for our um, community. Extinction Rebellion arranged their own events there, such as a die-in. XR Families arranged a family event within our museum space itself. But more interestingly, um, associated groups of local people um, started using it as a gathering place to discuss their concerns around the climate emergency. I think museums are free. Internally, we feel like they are places um, but often there's these invisible barriers. Um, and this was really interesting as a way of kind of breaking down these barriers and people feeling like they had a right to use the museum space, which was wonderful. Now, like everybody, um, the pandemic made us do a 360 again, and suddenly we couldn't have these big gatherings of people. And so things went online. Um, however, our model stayed the same. It was how could we use our collection to have contemporary relevance and how could we um, provide a platform for experts to talk to our large audiences. We also engaged with photographers who are out in the field um, with our exposure exhibition um, so they could communicate about their concerns about the changing ocean. And then finally, last month, building on our relationship through our polar collection, we we're very fortunate to welcome the RRS to David Attenborough and good old Boaty McBoatface to Greenwich um, and had a massive science festival where we were able to engage our audience who are used to coming to the museum to learn about history with cutting edge contemporary research. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Laura. That's great. So we heard a lot about stories um, in the session on sessions on um, day one, and I think that you've just brought those to life wonderfully for us. So thank you very much. Um, we will now pass over to Maker Sar, um, and I will switch my camera off again. Uh, good morning, everybody, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for TNA for organising this timely event. I would like to focus my five minutes on what working for environmental sustainability means for an academic. As an academic with a background in history, conservation and environmental engineering, I still reference the 1987 Brundtland Report in my teaching, as well as holding Sir Crispin Tickell's view that without environmental sustainability, we cannot achieve social and economic sustainability. So I'm very happy to be here today. Sir Crispin Tickell was the permanent representative of the United Kingdom to the United Nations when the Brundtland Report, or Our Common Future, the report of the World Commission on Environment and Develop Development was published. Its definition of sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs remains very relevant today. As an academic, I explore the why and why not, and the how and how not, because our research questions and our methods of investigations define us. Increasingly, we describe ourselves as being better off when working in partnership with others who are different to us, creating cross-disciplinary collaborations to tackle some of the most challenging environmental problems facing humanity. At the start of my career, we were breaking new ground when proposing that objects had to be studied in the context of the built environment in which they were situated and that buildings are influenced by the landscape and environment around them. We can choose when to allow air and light and choose the quality and quantity of air and light we let into our buildings, or we can choose to exclude them partially or completely. But to do so reliably and consistently in any context, and especially for museum, gallery, library or archive collections, we have known for at least a couple of decades 
that decisions that are based on cross-disciplinary and even cross-sectoral exchanges of knowledge and information are more robust, resilient and sustainable. So what does working for environmental sustainability look like from my perspective? From where do I approach environmental sustainability? I teach research and advise on the environment in buildings, as well as having commissioned research on environmental sustainability of museums, galleries, libraries and archives, advising policymakers on matters relating to environmental monitoring and control, and smaller museums, galleries, libraries and archives on all matters relating to preventive conservation. My driver has been climate change and how we safely dismantle the double standard of fossil fuel dependent tight environmental controls for collection conservation, which is so damaging to the planet on which humanity depends. Yet relaxing tight environmental control is risky when left to a single discipline to answer. Over the years, I have worked in teams that have included at various points, architects, art historians, artists, chemists, curators, designers, engineers, physicists, social scientists, and surveyors. Yet sustainable cross-disciplinary collaboration is not common even today. It is indeed very hard to achieve. Organizational structures, professional standards, professional liability insurance, remuneration, in other words, governance and finance, have evolved to create vertical silos around single disciplines, which are exceedingly strong and difficult to change. In the academy also, those engaged in cross-disciplinary research have to work at developing common research questions, at aligning different research methods, and argue on what constitutes impact. Yet environmental sustainability depends on silos being reduced by disruptive cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral teams, creating horizontal research links. Their determination to challenge the status quo and to create change by working together may lead to unexpected solutions to seemingly intractable environmental problems. Thank you. Thank you, May. That's wonderful. Every, everybody's echoing day one. It's wonderful. So another theme that was very strong on day one was partnerships and working in collaboration. And I think obviously May has kind of brought that back to our minds again today. So thank you, May. Um, and then finally, like I say, last but not least, I would like to um, uh, introduce Mark. If you want to switch your camera on. I'll do my best. Hopefully that's on. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name's Mark Sullivan. I'm the Estates Operations Manager here at the National Archives. Um, I don't have any slides, but um, I, my, I'm, I'm proposing just to talk through a story, really. And the story of really when I started working at uh, the National Archives in 2005, and, and, and being responsible for paying the utility bills, it, it became very apparent very quickly that the cost of those utility bills were going up every year. Um, so I started to look at how we might be able to achieve some savings to reduce those bills. Um, and I quickly also found that the major contributor to the use of electricity was the um, plants and equipment in support of our repository storage areas, which accounts for about 50% of our uh, floor plates in, in queue here. Um, I, I looked at the PD5454 standard and found that we were being asked to run our repository equipment to achieve 18 degrees C plus or minus one uh, and 50% RH plus or minus 5% and the equipment was running 24 7. Um, and I questioned um, at the time to say I, I don't understand why we need to run the equipment when when the building is closed um, and I was told well we have the standards that we need to keep um, the documents which is our uh, um, um, the standard that we need to keep the documents uh, repository stored in um, 
and and it's always been that way and so the question always been that way was something that i found quite well not amusing but, but certainly a challenge so i i went to speak to our collection care department to understand a bit more i understand more from them about what we in the states were being asked to do for which uh, the collection care manage and main ensure that we in the states look after the collection in the best possible way and they said to me um we've never been asked that question we've never been asked why can you switch the plant equipment off all we've ever done is looked at the the uh, temperature graphs that we get we've got paper-based thermohydrographs in in repository storage areas and we look at those um, and we check those against every month and we talk to you and we say whether the equipment is working okay and you say that it is um, so what are, you, what are you looking to do so I said well what I'd like to do is is try switching some plant off in some areas so we are fortunate that in our building two we've got 12 document storage areas and they said well we're not we don't think that we can let you do that to all document storage areas but if we were to pick one what could you do so i said well um i've got uh, a building management system that electronically records temperature and humidity and if we switch the plant equipment off i can look at what the impact of the change to that uh, box that contained area um, and we can then review with you what that might mean in terms of operation and they said well we need a bit more than that we, you know we're, we're scientists so we need to have data in order to be able to inform us as to the decision making that you're asking us to buy into so i said to them well i, I absolutely support that and i think um, that what i can do is look at our bms our building management system and we'll be able to look to see how if the building that but that particular repository area uh, goes out of condition we can get the plant equipment to start automatically and bring it back into control and they said well if you can evidence that to us then we will consider with you whether that can be rolled out across more of repository areas or perhaps the the two buildings that we have uh, the two buildings that we have um, and, and and that took that took a, took a little bit of while and a bit of effort to demonstrate to collection care but I, I think really the, the story here is 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 based what Jenny was saying before about collaboration um, but I think the use of data is a very very powerful tool because if you've got information that you can collect and information that you can share I think it makes decision making and the choices that you make um, perhaps easier to do and certainly gives you an informed decision as opposed to putting perhaps your collection at risk which is, is, is obviously nobody's choice um, so that that's that's a story that um, I started with and of course following on from that it meant that I could start to look at back turning it off on weekends and bank holidays and we continue to do that um, um, now um, when we look at um, um, the, the impact of, of what that means to us in reality uh, as a central government department we are signed up to and have to provide uh, we work to the greening government commitments so in 2009-10 there was a baseline set for um, greenhouse gas emissions and our utility costs in that in that year period which is our baseline was 1.4 million um, to give you an indication of what that means today um, our utility cost last year was 747,000 so we are we're certainly hitting the, the government targets but it also means that by reducing the runtime of plant equipment it means that the life cycle for that plant equipment um, has an extended life because we're now no longer running it 24 7 it means that therefore the period between that change um, is extended uh, and therefore the capital expenditure that you have to look at uh, it, it, you can you can perhaps flatten the peaks and troughs of the capital expenditure in looking at those changes it also fed into uh, a report that collection care started to do and I believe it may have been mentioned by Sarah of some building modeling um, because in our building one our repositories have open windows or ha have windows that are that could open but are, but are not open obviously and um, some of them were, were were leaking and 
we wanted to understand with collection care whether we could do some modeling to see whether replacing the windows would be um would be the right answer whether blocking them up might be the right answer and the building model helped us determine what the figures the cost would be for um for the replacement of those windows and it fed into our corporate spending review uh which we submitted to treasury for replacement and repair of those windows jenny you'll have to uh, just remind me whether i run up to five minutes or more because i didn't press my time as i say start or stop you probably are coming up to five minutes, Mark, but that's all right. Okay. Um, there are other perhaps um, things we may talk about. So we, we I looked at, um, in order to reduce the energy costs, we, we, we use standard um, screw compressor for um, chillers, um, but found actually that we moved to a different technology, uh, a different technology um, called turbo core. And that turbo core chiller technology, the startup current for those is five amps as opposed to 20 or 30 kilowatts for a screw compressor and therefore it it, um, it enabled us to to also significantly in, you know reduce our energy consumption um, when repositories are cooled and and heated um, we've we've looked at uh, desiccant dehumidification for some areas um, and we did that because in building two if we've got 12 repositories that come on but we've got one repository which we've got a closer temperature control that may have been discussed on Monday. Um, we use so we've got film film um, storage area, and we control that to 16 degrees and about 40% RH. But out of control, it, it it drifts out of control more often than the rest of the repositories, which are more paper based, and therefore um, we've introduced different technology to stop us using the, 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 the large energy consuming plant equipment and I'm guessing from um, <laughs> I'm, I'm due to stop. <laughs> Thanks Mark that's wonderful because it's good to have the detail you you've got your you've got your fingers on the detail and I think um, that is important because that's what's going to make the difference having that detail having that kind of decision making done. Um, may I introduce may I invite the rest of the panelists though to also put their cameras on so we're not all on our own here Mark and I that'd be wonderful thank you um, so thank you very much to all of the speakers for sharing their perspectives their thoughts we're now sort of moving into this more interactive um, part of the session so as a reminder you know if you want to join the discussion do just put your hand up um, if you just want to put questions into the chat, that's fine. I am just about managing to monitor the chat. Um, we haven't had a lot of <laughs> a lot of questions in the chat just yet. So what I thought I might start with is um, kind of trying to pull out some of the themes. So there has been this theme around partnerships here and collaboration that's come out a little bit and we've also kind of seen how that works so we've got kind of mark talking to from estates talking to collection care within the tna context and the difference that that's made so i just wondered if if anybody had any kind of thoughts or advice on how you go about kind of building these partnerships may you've spoken about cross-disciplinary and the importance of that within this context but you know obviously that's within an academic context but also within the business context so please yes may <laughs> um this is where i think we have a, a still a major challenge to overcome i think this is not about cross-disciplinarity within our own institutions this is cross-disciplinarity not across institutions but also across sectors so if for the moment i identify myself with being in academia then what we do is partner with others who are different to ourselves. We rarely partner with other ac academics unless we are applying for a funding call that requires us to do that. Because quite naturally, what we are drawn to is actually working with cultural institutions because the perspective and the questions that are asked by cultural institutions is different to that in my sector. In academic. The big challenge we have is that there are still too few collaborations which are cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral and that is the emphasis that I want to make because we can say that it is cross-disciplinary if you have scientists, technologists and engineers working together but 
that is not really taking it to the point where you're getting different viewpoints from the arts and humanities, from the social sciences, where actually that should be the driver of the science. And that is where collaboration then will really make a difference. Thank you, May. I think we've been we've been joined by Joseph. I don't know if you want to say something. Hi. Hi. Just trying to make the sound work. Hello, everyone. That was fascinating. I, I wanted to ask to to build on on this last question, and ask um, how how specifically could cross disciplinarity uh, contribute to environmental sustainability? It's clear. It's desirable but how it will uh, provide additional benefits? I think what I tried to say in my short five minutes is that we cannot really achieve lower risk in terms of our decisions if we do not take the points of view on board of a range of disciplines that are interested. And what we've seen and heard over the last two days at the TNA on Monday and today is the real commitment to dealing with the climate crisis. That commitment is shared in academic circles. Surely this is an opportunity for us to build solutions by working together. So cross-disciplinarity will achieve better results for environmental sustainability because different minds from different perspectives will come together to create solutions that are more robust that's my view anyway thank you may and thank you joseph for um joining the table i don't know if anybody of the other panelists would like to comment on this maybe not in the kind of cross-disciplinarity but the partnerships william yeah i mean i can I echo some of that we've heard i mean i in my context, the digital is disruptive, okay? And and the question, a serious question to ask is whether we will have archives in 10 years, okay? Or 20 years or 50 years. What are the institutional changes that will occur, partly in response to the climate crisis, but also in relation to the sorts of uh, challenges we face and or opportunities that arise in the context of technology? So I don't over egg this too much just for the sake of making kind of facetious argument but you know in the context of digital preservation it's clear that the agencies which have the digital preservation problem don't identify themselves as archives in the first instance so the preservation has to move tremendously far upstream and the point of creation of the digital resources for it really to be an effective process and frankly if we leave digital preservation to the archivist it's almost already too late you know we need to move much much earlier in creating digital resources which are sustainable and which are useful and that's the sort of disruption which I see in my work right I see that routinely in the context of the DPC it's why we started with my, uh, with archives and libraries and museums and those sorts of institutions and now we find ourselves with uh, all sorts of different sectors and all sorts you know banks and, and all sorts of different agencies getting involved because they're creating and they recognize the need to, to step in much earlier they don't think of themselves as archives at all and and I don't want to overstate this in the context of, of the, the argument here just to be sort of facetious or to provoke but the, but I think we do need to look at the institutional underpinnings uh, that, that will move us forward here and, and are we in control of those or are we simply responding uh, to outside pressures and maybe the to turn that into a slogan because you know me it would be to, to question you know are, are we scared of the change or are we going to be that change you know we're going to are we going to take control of the situation and do uh, achieve the kind of strategic goals which we know uh, need to uh, need to happen thank you yes i think we could probably go on about partnerships and collaboration for for a while and also in in some ways that feeds into that other theme we had yesterday about advocacy because it's that kind of kind of getting your point across to others who perhaps don't share their perspectives. We'll maybe come back to that, but I do want to try and address the questions that are coming up in the chat. And one of them has, has come up from Mark, and it's around this kind of um, just maybe broadening it out a bit, because obviously you focused on this kind of repositories and the, the, the archive um, archive repository and the energy of that but more broadly obviously um you know estates is are bigger than just our repositories our estates are bigger than our repositories so are there any sort of examples of other things that can, that are done at kind of that that broader level and welcome david we'll get to you in a minute i'll just let mark answer that question you might need to turn your microphone on <laughs> 
uh, yes, I think, I think another good example uh, could be to do with uh, paper usage as an example. So uh, when, I, when I started to look at um, the paper usage that we consume, um, I also found that uh, across TNA, I went to our IT department and to ask them how many network printers do we have for the 500 staff that we've got? And they said, oh, we've got 200. I said, pardon? Yeah, we've got 200 printers. Uh, and obviously there's the cost of the consumables. Uh, the, you know, the, the, so the printers are relatively inexpensive, but the consumables are very expensive. So actually I looked at, um, and going through a government framework, look to, to replace all of the network printers with centralized MFDs. So we moved from 200 plus printers to 23 MFDs. Um, so it, 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 it was a challenge because everybody was very, they said, but, but, but this is my printer. <laughs> who's, who's going, if I don't, I don't want to be able to print to a, de a device because it means that somebody's going to be able to see it. I said, no, because the printer actually is controlled by a card, a MyFair card, which we can link in with our access control system, which means that if you print something and you and you want to go and get it, it's, it's, it's a short walk, which is good for you because it gets you up from your desk. Um, and also, of course, we also, found, we also found that people that print things were printing them and then they may be a 20 page report but they've spelt the first page that a couple of things wrong. Did they print the first page again? No, they print the whole report again. And so therefore we could build into the MFD technology, the ability to say, well, if printing is not collected by the person within two or three hours, it deletes it from the queue. We also introduced where people were to say, okay, well, I want to print 20 copies of a, a report. So rather than using the local device, which would um, stop other people from being able to walk up and collect their print, we could intercept the printing and send it to a fast copy department, which again could look after the higher volumes. So that, that was op that opportunity. Um, I also started to look at um, the, the space environment for people um, and, and the lighting. So we use, uh, have used fluorescent lighting for a long, long time. Um, and fluorescent lighting over the course of its life, um, it, it loses the it loses the output of light. So we've moved to LED technology. And when you move to LED technology, we use some um, CAD modeling to understand, first of all, by changing to, CAD, to LED lighting, how many fittings could I reduce in, a, in, a, in an area? Uh, and we wanted to make sure I do that rather than affect the people in the space. So we to get the uh, it's all the evidence to prove what we were doing, uh, and we found that if you move to LED lighting, you can regularly reduce the number of fittings that you've got by thirty to forty percent, but improve the lighting. You know, we we use cool white light, LED lighting in our in our office environment, and we do that for a number of reasons. One is because LED lighting does not um, produce any ultraviolet light, so it's not detrimental to paper; it doesn't discolor it. Uh, it has a long life. Um, it is. Um, it, it doesn't mind being switched on and off regularly. So we use presence detection to manage the number of, you know, to manage areas because even though people want to be conscious about the energy that they consume, not everybody turns the light switch off when they leave a meeting room. A lot of people leave it on because, of course, it's not their room. So now we use presence detection for that. Um, and 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 there was uh, the the benefit of LED is that it doesn't generate as much heat as a standard fluorescent fitting. So therefore, it also means that the return air path that goes back to our centralized plant equipment hasn't got to manage that heat load. It now is cooler, so it is, uses less energy. And there are a number of items. Um, probably, I think also one of the best things I think that we started at TNA was we set up a greening champions group of people. Um, so that enabled us to to reach out to departments for them to start to look at, you know, where we might reduce, regi sorry, regi re I'm going to need a glass of water. <laughs> to reduce single use plastics. So we've reduced plastic cups. We've introduced rice husk instead because it's a, it's, it's it, generally it's a waste product from the rice husk a waste product, but it's been converted into a, a cup now that you can that you can use and stops us using single use plastic. And that was a phenomenal change. And, and that was driven through that Greening Champions group because that was a, a reflection of what 
people wanted to change. They wanted to see that change. So it was a way of getting information back to estates for us to be able to look at how we might be able to roll out a change. Thank you. And I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's great because it's again, it's it's all the little actions that build up. And I know that um, after the break, we may hear about um, setting up sort of greening networks within within organisations. But David, as you've joined us, we should very much um, ask your question. Please do. Oh, thank you, and thank you to all the uh, presenters tonight. Great presentations, and I've got a, a, a question um, for May and. Um, Everything that May said resonated with me very, very quickly um, about, about collaboration. It just reminded me of some work we're doing, and we, we're looking at the ASHRAE Chapter 24 for the Gallery, Libraries, Archives and Museums about um, how to manage um, environments in working. There's a very good uh, diagram there about how you can collaborate with a number of people across the organisation, but my question really is, is in regard to, um, have you got an example or an exemplar where you've, you've um, experienced and see how that collaboration has, collaboration has worked effectively? I'm really interested in that, thank you. Well, I would like in, um, to mention that the early work that was done by the TNA was in fact done in collaboration with the Bartlett, which is my faculty um, at UCL. And the modeling work was done in order to look at different scenarios, the very early work, uh, which the TNA took on and then developed on its own. But it was, um, it was a very, um, it, was a, it was a collaboration based on enormous respect on both sides, um, huge trust on both sides, and the ability to share successes and failures. And it was, it was a very, very good experience. And that was very uh, many years ago now, I think it was 2007, if, if I don't, uh, if I remember correctly that uh, Mark mentioned. Um, and so that was a very good example. All our research is done collaboratively with partners that are not academic institutions. And we do that with large and small organizations. Unfortunately, we tend to collaborate, and I say this unfortunately, guardedly, because larger organizations, larger cultural organizations, have the capacity to undertake research in a way that smaller museums, galleries, libra libraries, and archives do not. And one of the things that I have desired for a very long time is for coalitions of smaller organizations to be formed like cooperatives, where in fact they could work as one organization, share the benefits of collaborating with academic researchers in order to benefit um, themselves. That has not happened. Um, it's something that sometimes I dream about, but I'm not in a position to make that happen, if you see what I mean. But certainly we collaborate um, with large institutions by default, and we would like to collaborate with smaller institutions by desire. I hope that answers your questions, David. Thank you, David. Does that answer your question? Um, Thank you. Yes, yes. very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, um, the research and academic engagement department at the National Archives is very much around trying to build this collaboration. And we do recognise that as, you know, a very large institution, we are in the privileged position of actually being able to undertake this sort of work and hoping that it can then filter through to, to the wider sector. Um, we do have some other questions. I think Graham might have joined us. Hi there. Um, thank you, everybody. Really interesting, as was Monday's session. Um, my question is, I work at, a, I'm the archive manager at a relatively small charity, Yorkshire Film Archive. Um, we have two sites, um, one in York, one in Teesside. Um, vaults, lots of storage. Um, film is very different to paper, etc. Lots of uh, digital assets as well. I'm really keen to get a baseline sort of what our climate impact is um, so that we can look at use that to get stakeholders, trustees, the team involved so that we can measure where we are so we can look at the challenges and opportunities going forwards. Um, very little funding. I think we probably need an external advisor for a number of reasons. 
the expertise, but also if it's me saying we need to do this, it'd be less maybe engaged. If it's someone else coming in and saying, you need to do this, is this is where you can improve. I think that would help our sort of uh, engagement and advocacy within the organization. Are there any funding pots to be able to get us over that first stage to just get someone in, get us started, and then we can look at how we can implement some of those changes? Does anybody know of any funding pots? I mean, I, th I think that there is support. Some of the networks from day one may help, but if, any if anybody here has any answers, may. And also in the chat. So if anybody else knows in the chat, please help help Graham out and put them in the chat. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Please may. do. And, and sorry, May, just before you do, the coalition idea is great because we're part of a wider Film Archives UK, which is lots of smaller archives. I'm hoping this could be the snowball effect that if we can do it, then we can... Um, spread that learning across the, the rest of this sector. So there's, there's, there's room for growth. Well, if these smaller archives could get together from the beginning and, and come up with a joint plan, then you could share it and uh, fundraising becomes easier because you, you share that as well. Uh, many years ago, the government had an energy design advice scheme, which ran for a number of years and it was regionally based. And then they scrapped it. Um, and it was one of the most effective small sources of small pots of money to give energy advice um, that there was. As an academic, we're always on the search for good projects that our master's students and PhD students could take on. It depends on your timescale, your timeline and your flexibility because we can't force projects onto students though we can guarantee excellent results. That is an option that is available to you. And it's always one that any academic institution would be happy to talk to you about, I imagine. We certainly would be. Maybe we can connect and have a conversation about that. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? Is that all right, Graham? Was that enough for now? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a start. We've, you've got to start somewhere, haven't you? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And talking about starting somewhere, um, we are kind of be moving in a little while into the next session, which is kind of act now. So I just wondered if everybody here maybe wanted to sort of what one thing would you suggest is the most important thing people could be doing now? So what kind of one thing would you kind of recommend they think about or they take action on on now? I don't know who wants to start. Oh, May's going to start. <laughs> I would say reduce dependence on air conditioning. Just turn the thing off. I mean, you have done it in a, uh, the TNA has done it in a systematic way based on evidence and therefore your risks were low because you, you did it the right way around. But essentially in non-critical areas, and I call critical areas those where collections are and housed or displayed, um, one the low hanging fruit is that offices um, and common spaces do not need to be air conditioned. We are able to live with, we're being encouraged to ventilate our, our spaces now for COVID reasons. I think the environment has been asking us to do that for a very long time. And I think we just need to reduce our dependence on air conditioning. Thank you. That's a very simple action. That's good. Anybody else want to say, William, I think you've got your hand up. Yeah, so I mean, I kind of agree with me. And also, uh, add, uh, we, need to, we, we need to put carbon costs into our procurement processes at every level, at every level of what we're doing. Uh, and that requires us to take control of how other industries relate to us, you know. Uh, it's lovely to think of, for example, we've had examples of new buildings and new repositories being built. But think of the concrete, think of the steel, think of all of the other costs which are being embedded there. We need to take radical control of the 
the cost, the carbon costs associated with all of the other touch points we have. And the easiest way to do that in large, especially large public institutions, is to take control of the procurement piece. And for me, that relates back then to some of the procurement processes we will go through in terms of computing, right? So uh, cloud computing, do we really trust the figures which are given to us about the, the carbon footprint of those data centres when they need to be audited, they need to be made uh, uh, subject to public scrutiny, uh, and they need to be handed over to the likes of me and some of our PhD students, frankly, to see if the claims being made are credible, because I fear that they are not, and I fear we may only find that out when it's too late. Yeah. Thank you. Mark, Laura, do you want to put your thoughts forward on that? No, well, I mean, we do have Julie I joining do. us. So I'll go on. I'll go on then, Laura, Laura, and then Mark. <laughs> now both rushed for it. Um, slow internet. Sorry. Um, I, I've got many things I can say. There's, there's many things we could, we should all be doing. Um, and I agree with the two previous points. But I think from an operational point of view, it's empowering our staff and the staff that we work alongside. Um, and and as has been touched on in people's talk, there's lots of little things that people can be doing but I think often coming from a really big organization people don't always feel like they, they have the power to do that um, and I think it's actually listening to staff listening to individual teams um, and letting them make those those small changes. Thank you Laura and Mark. You, you do need to put your mic on. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing as Laura, because I think actually uh, all of us as individuals, you know, it, 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 we all can do a small thing and it's collectively all those small things add up to quite a lot. It also means that you're able to, you know, inform your seniors, you know, the, the people that make decisions about funding. You know, if, if they if they listen to their staff and we do all do staff surveys huh, that, you know, a lot of them want to have feedback. Uh, and and I think we should all encourage the feedback to be turned into reality as opposed to just planning it, putting it on a shelf and not doing it. Um, as an example for myself, um, my wife and I uh, every year as part of the marine um, biology uh, group, we, we do um, litter picking on beaches. And I went there for the first year and I, I was a bit doubtful about it. And, and my wife said, well, I think we should go along and see. And the one thing that I learned from that really, which was amazing, was an amazing event, was that it's the story. And they said, if, if you take if there's one thing you take away from this today, it's about what you can tell your children about when they go to a beach. Would The right thing that we want everybody to do is if you go to the beach is just do for 10 minutes, a bit of a litter pick and put things in the bin then we wouldn't all be standing here today having to collect all the all the litter that is on the beaches. And not least of which, it's about putting the litter in the right place. You know, people, you know, why, why I don't understand why people throw things, you know, on the floor. Why, why, why do they throw things in the sea? We should all be morally more responsible. And I think that messaging needs to go out to everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And Julie, I think we are going to squeeze your question in since you've, since you've bravely um, joined us. I feel we should um, ask, answer your question. Hi, sorry, Zoom was playing up for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm in the process of being part of a building project. Um, the archives, um, I work at Lewisham, Lewisham Council, the archives are on the top floor of the Lewisham Library building. The building needs a lot of work doing to it, which we're hoping to start next year. Um, it's how I can actually feed into that process, the needs for a fully functional archive store and search room within the costs that the council has for the building as a whole, which is a library, so it's to a library standard, um, but it still needs to actually meet the standards for an archive and to be as environmentally friendly as possible. And it's how do I involve the architects and the procurement people in making sure that we can achieve those, those objectives um, it's, it's a difficult process when you're not leading on the implementation of the work. It's being done to you, as it were. Um, and I think that's, that's a problem for archives within local authorities is that we're quite often not the main drivers. Um, so any input on changing that balance would be appreciated. 
Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any advice for Julie? Again, I think it's that kind of partnership, isn't it? And advocacy, mm -hmm. and May. So Julie, um, I do understand your predicament. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's like trying to jump onto a moving bus, isn't it? I, I would suggest first and foremost, you find out where the project has got to um, already because you would need to tailor your expectations to where the project has got to already. If it's still very much at the concept stage, then providing information to the design team will help them very much. So you become a provider of helpful information, which is the way you winkle your way in. If it's gone further down the line, you can still provide useful information and gain their trust so that they see you as a person that mm. wishes to help with information and knowledge and understand that they, are, they have a duty of care to the whole building and all the occupants. That would be where I would start. You have to find out where the project is at the moment. Yeah, the project is quite far down the road. Ah. Yeah. Um, I've sent them the British standard for archive stores um, and any advice that we've got from the TNA as to, to what should be there. Um, but of course, local authority archives aren't statutory services. The library is. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. you're a junior partner, however these things go. So, mm. yeah, but th thank you for the, for the advice. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very quickly, Mark, because we're um, up yep. out of time. I would, I would suggest to Jenny that part of the stakeholder group, she would need to include a building services engineer or consultancy company that would work directly for her to feed into the architectural design so that, so that they, are, they are pushing the design onto the architects rather than the architects providing a design that meets their objectives. So it looks at the clear objectives that are set out in your brief to the architectural practice and the building services engineer as to the delivery of what you want for that space. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Julie, for the question. Um, so I think we are at time and I do want to keep to time so that people get a proper break. I want to say thank you very much to all of our speakers, William, Mark, May and Laura, and also to all the questions and um, all the people who've been promoted up to, to speak on screen. Thank you very much. Um, we will now have a 20 minute break and we will be back at 11.20 um, with our final session, which we're calling Act Now.
Hello, Hi Val, we can see you perfectly. We're ready to start. <laughs> okay, lovely. I was just going to give it a go. I was just going to leave it one more minute to see if um, uh, another couple of people wanted to join us, but I'm going to make a start. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so thank you everybody and welcome to our fourth and final session of the event. Um, oh, sorry, my screen's playing up slightly. So uh, Give me for um, that, that slight hesitation. This uh, session is called Act Now and uh, given the title you will guess uh, what the subject is going to be. So we've asked four speakers to give us some, some really kind of concrete examples of ways we can work towards environmental sustainability right now. We're going to have um, the four, it's going to be a very tight session, um, so we just say we do have four speakers, um, so we're going to have the speakers first and then we're going to have a Q&A um, at the end, uh, and it's, it's, so it's going to be very tight for time, so can I just um, remind my speakers it would be great to, if you could stick to the, to the time allotted to you so that we've got a little bit of time for Q&A at the end, uh, and we're going to um, do exactly that. So we're going to do the presentations first um, and then go on to, to the Q&A which will involve all of them in a panel session. So given that we are quite tight on time, I'm going to uh, introduce our um, first speaker, uh, Lorraine Finch, who you can see on, on your screen. Uh, I'm delighted that Lorraine's as she is waving. Um, Lorraine is a, is a conservationist and a conservator. Um, she's director and founder of LFCP, uh, established in 2003, which assists institutions to work with environmental sustainability embedded into their practices to enable digital transformation and to ensure a skilled and knowledgeable workforce through bespoke training and workshops. She's also a trustee of the Institute of Conservation and co-founder and chair of the ICON Environmental Sustainability Network. Over to you, Lorraine. Delighted to have you join us. OK, thanks very much. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. You will have seen that the title of my talk is blah, blah, blah. It's time to start doing. Now, Stop talking and start doing is my personal mantra around environmental sustainability. The science is unequivocal. We are in a climate emergency. There is no more time for talking. It is time to act. And I just want to show you this. This is my placard that I took round an Extinction Rebellion march in September. So stop talking, start doing. That is my personal mantra. And the lovely early 20th century, much more eloquent version of deeds, not words. Now, in my job as an environmental sustainability consultant, I do get to experience firsthand the reasons why people say that they are struggling with starting on that journey of environmental sustainability, those blockers that help that make them feel stuck. So I'm going to go through those blockers, not in any particular order, and give you some evidence as to why they aren't blockers. So fear, there is a very, very great fear of doing the wrong thing. That's both in terms of the environment, the climate and the environment, and also for the object. So, for example, if you change the bags in the shop from plastic bags to paper bags, is that going to have a negative environment, environmental impact that you haven't factored in? In terms of the object, there's a lot of discussion around mount board. So the mount board that conservators use to mount flat paper objects, so watercolours, documents, parchments, that sort of thing, they can do that so they can put them on exhibition or they can um, store them long term. Mount board can't be recycled because it contains EVA, which is a plastic based adhesive. Mount board could be recycled if we put in starch based adhesives instead. However, there is resistance to doing that when in some quarters because there is concern that that will attract pests. So there is that fear of if I do this, am I going to make the situation worse either for climate and the environment or for the object? There's also the feeling of that fear of not knowing enough. I don't know enough, so therefore I can't start because I need to know everything before I do. And there's that feeling that you need to do everything, that just doing one thing won't be enough. You've got to do everything. So that's fear. There's also that feeling of one of the other blockers is not knowing and uh, not knowing where to start. So the whole thing is really overwhelming. I mean, you know, climate crisis, it's a big issue. Where do you start with that? So in your archive, do you start with the things that are easy to do? Do you take a longer term view and you go for those actions that are going to take longer to do, but longer term, you will achieve them? Do you start with those areas where you're going to make the biggest impact? Or do you start where the areas where you can make small, small wins? 
So do you do a bit of everything or do you target one area? These are all questions. They're all very good questions. Plus people feel like another one of the blockers is that they feel like there's too much information. So there's too much information out there about climate and the environment, and therefore that stops them from starting. However, there's also the feeling that there's too little information because really, and that, that's come up over these last two days, but what information is out there that is specific to the cultural heritage sector and therefore, and also specific to archives and conservation. Powerlessness. That's the one that I come across a lot. People feel that they're not particularly powerful. And also in the face of this really big question, the problem is so big, what can you do to make a difference? How will your efforts make an impact? So I was mulling over this question. I want to change my gas cooker from an electric cooker to start tackling my methane emissions. And I was thinking, well, you know, how much difference is that going to make in comparison to the leaks of the, the big com companies like Shell and BP? You know, what's that one little action going to, what difference is that going to make? However, every action makes a difference. Every small, tiny action, you know, regardless of its size, is going to make a difference. And I'm going to give you an example of that. In 2019, UK solar photovoltaic passed 13,000 megawatts. That is double the capacity of the world's largest nuclear power station. And 20% of that 13,000 megawatts came from UK domestic solar arrays. Even though the average size of a UK solar array is 0.00325 megawatts. So every tiny thing adds up. There's also a feeling of powerlessness in your work. I'm only a small cog in a large machine. I feel that I'm low down in the hierarchy and anything that I say is not going to be listened to. However, there is a phenomena called performative environmentalism. So you go into work with your vegetarian sandwiches, you've cycled into work, somebody sees you doing that and they think, do you know what, if Sue is doing that, I can do that and I can do this as well. And your efforts will be noticed and it will go higher and higher up the change. They will see you make a difference and it will inspire and empower others to do also. It also, in some ways, issues a challenge higher up the chain. Now, we all work for businesses, regardless of whether we're self-employed or employed within an organisation. It's still a business. Money comes in, money goes out. So public, funders, clients, customers, they are all now going to start querying what you and your organisation are doing around sustainability. If you can't answer that question or if you give them a fudged answer, they are going to take their business elsewhere. So it is imperative to get that message through. Cost. Cost is another blocker I hear a lot. Oh, it's too costly. No, there's nothing I can do. It's just all very expensive. It, some of the environmental sustainability actions do take money to implement. Fair enough. But there are many that you can take which are either low cost or no cost. And those which do cost quickly pay for themselves. And we've had some examples of that this morning. So last week I was um, part of a, a webinar and one of the people who was participating gave an example. So they're a UK university museum and they, re they replaced all of their lighting with LED. Now that paid for itself in energy savings within 18 months. And as we've also heard today, no UV. So let's have some examples of some actions you can take immediately. Now, the current model of the economy, the economy that we have is take, make, waste. Now, we need to change that to the four R's, which is refuse, reduce, reuse and recycle. These four R's need to be applied to every aspect of your work and indeed your life. That would be even better. So. When you're at work, think about where you can put, implement those four R's. So that things, things like equipment and material, in your studio, your archive and your office, in the energy that you're using in all of the work that you're doing, the water usage around digital. So we've had digital preservation today, but I'm sort of meaning digital more in terms of what we're doing now. So webinars, the laptops you use, the mobile phones you use, all that sort of thing, how you store your um, information travel and transport and finally money so now i'm going to give you some examples of how i've applied those four r's in my work so refuse very simply don't buy more than you need and actually 
It also is refuse to support businesses and organisations that damage the climate and the environment. An example of this for me is that I've changed all of my personal and business banking and my pension to providers who do not finance or invest in oil, coal, gas, airlines, tobacco, weapons and other unsavoury practices. The banks um, and pension providers that I found also are aiding the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient future. Your money can make a huge difference. Reduce. Reduce is reduce the amount that you use. So use only the minimum necessary. My last laptop I had for 11 years. And rather cheekily, Apple, when I spoke to them, used to always refer to it as being vintage. Now, the reason I managed to get that to last 11 years is that I installed more memory onto it. So I was able to use that for as long as possible. The reason I had to change in the end and what I did do when I changed is I bought a second hand computer. So mobile phone companies, um, you know, make manufacturers of laptop like Apple and so forth. They like to bring out the new Wizzy product once a year. Now, some people like to have the new Wizzy product once a year, which means that once a year, the market gets full of computers and phones and so forth that have only been used for one year. And it's one of those that I bought. So I bought a second hand laptop, which was two years old at that time. The only reason why I had to stop using my poor old vintage laptop, which I would still be using otherwise, is it would no longer talk to the internet because I couldn't upgrade the operating system any further. So another way of reducing is thinking before you thank. So basically reduce the number of emails that you send per day. If each adult in the UK sent one less email per day, that would prevent 16,433 tonnes of CO2 per year being emitted. That is the equivalent of 81,152 flights from London to Madrid, or the equivalent of 3,334 diesel cars off the road. Just one little email. So today, what one email can you not send? Or maybe even two, that would be even better. So reuse, reuse absolutely everything. So I'll give you an example here. When I run the warm water, if I'm doing a wash, so if I'm doing an aqueous treatment on a piece of paper and I need water at 40 degrees centigrade, the water will run cold before it runs hot. Now, what I do with that is I collect that in a watering can and I use that to water the plants in the studio garden. The World Wide Fund for Nature recommends that you collect that water in a bottle and you keep it and you use it to fill the kettle. So when you want to have a cup of tea or coffee or whatever, you've got the water there ready to be used and you're not wasting anything. So recycling. There's very, very little from my studio that goes into the waste. Now, I, in my borough council, I do not have waste collection at my doorstep. So either household waste or um, recycling. So I am very reliant on what I can access on foot. So I have become very good at finding the high street stores that offer recycling. And it really is amazing how much you can recycle on the high street. So Superdrug and Boots take the tubes that we use. So if you've got tubes of starch paste and so forth, you can take all your tubes in there and you can recycle them. Clarks have this really fantastic um, link up with UNICEF where you can take in old shoes, so your work shoes. They use the money that they raise from that to buy, um, pay for schools and bicycles for children to get to school. Tesco's. Tesco's, you can take your plastic film to be recycled, but it's not just the soft plastic film I've discovered, it's all plastic film. So I have now saved up a very large bag of, of film that next time I wander over to Tesco's, I will be taking with me. B&Q, they take small electrical items like hand drills and so forth. So those are a very small selection of the tips that I have and things that I do in the, my day-to-day -day life. I have many, many more, and I have started writing a book called Low Cost, No Cost Tips for Sustainability and Cultural Heritage, of which chapter one is now available on my website. I will say that this is not a, a plug for you to all rush out and buy a book because it's all going to be available free of charge 
on my website. There'll be 10, there's uh, 10 chapters in all covering all of those areas that we spoke about earlier. So the equipment and materials, the studio, your energy use, your water use, your digital, your travel and transport and your money and a few others as well. If you've got anything that you'd like to add to that, to those tips, I'm quite happy to add your tips in as well. So that's me. Thank you very much for listening. That's a whistle stop tour around start doing and stop talking. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there's been absolutely loads of, uh, of particularly uh, astonishing feedback about the um, uh, the email statistics. And, and people have asked Lorraine, I, I said I'd ask you um, to possibly put in the chat once you finish speaking, the statistics around the, the one, e one fewer email, which are, are, are loads of people with uh, are, people have really responded to that with a really positive way. That's okay. that sounded really with a huge appetite and, and effectiveness. So thank you very much for using it's that. It's amazing, isn't it? You just don't account. think. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Loads to um, to pick up and there, uh, you can see there's some lovely positive um, uh, feedback coming in as well. Um, so as I said, we're going to move on to our next speaker and pick up the questions because we are a little bit short of time. So without further ado, I will um, introduce our next speaker um, who, who you can see up here, appearing on the screen. Um, uh, I'll say good morning, but we're, we are just about still in the morning. Good morning, morning, Arielle. Morning. Um, so our second speaker is Arielle Jula, who is a preventive conservator based in Northumberland, um, having graduated as an MA in preventive conservation from Northumbria University in 2017. Um, Arielle has also completed internships with the National Trust for Scotland, the University of Edinburgh and most recently the National Library of Scotland and that's been focusing on emergency response plans and salvage operations. She's currently working as a freelance conservator based in the north of England and she's also a collections officer for the National Trust. Thanks very much for joining us Arielle, over to you. Great, thank you very much Valerie. I'm just going to load up my PowerPoint. Give me one moment here. Okay, thank you very much. So today I want to discuss my emergency response research that I conducted as part of an Institute of Conservation internship with the National Library of Scotland that was funded by the Cloth Workers Foundation. The internship focused on reviewing the emergency response plans for the library as well as conducting research into industry best practice and looking at recommendations on how to make improvements. The internship project ran from March 2021 through June and I worked remotely for the duration. The project was conducted over three work phases. The initial digital documentation audit and internal interviews with staff and colleagues involved in emergency response. A benchmarking exercise that included a survey and external interviews and a data analysis we looked at the information gathered from the first two phases and made recommendations for improvement. So today I'd like to discuss the survey and, um, and external interviews for the benchmarking. The survey I conducted had 32 questions across six main themes. It ran for three weeks and had 27 respondents. The majority of respondents came from archives, libraries and universities, with museums, historic properties and galleries also well represented. I also conducted external interviews with indus industry um, colleagues who were involved in emergency planning and salvage response. And this included colleagues from Historic Environment Scotland, Museum of London, the Watts Artist Gallery, Edinburgh City Council, National Records of Scotland, Harwell Restoration, and of course, the National Archives of London. The benchmarking was based around six key themes. And today for this session about Act Now, I'd like to focus on three. I'd like to look at the um, survey data, interview comments, and also recommendations around these areas. So the first one is communication, how we present information within our emergency response plans, staff awareness, and how we communicate during the incidents and further field, access awareness and awareness, how staff access digital and physical copies of plans, and also awareness of the existence of procedures across staff, um, and salvage teams and training. And this is looking at who's on our salvage teams, how they're trained, um, particularly for non-specialist staff, and also welfare and expectations during a salvage incident. So the survey data for communication showed that just under half of respondent organizations made sure that all staff had awareness of the emergency response plan. This meant that over half organizations 
staff were not aware of an existence of a plan or what would happen in, in case of an incident um, escalation. How organizations communicate during an incident was also really mixed. Just under half had defined communication channels, and this could have been um, an incident response monitoring pro program or a set of emails that they would normally send during any incidents. While around a quarter did one-off communications, so things they would just decide during an incident. And around 17% only let people know uh, in order to see incident happened after the emergency um, response and salvage. A decision to enact a phone list or call out um, relies with mainly senior management or incident salvage coordinators for the majority of organizations. Some of the comments that I've found in interviews and surveys were really interesting and quite diverse. A lot of people did mention business continuity plans and communication plans, although a number also mentioned that even with the best laid plans, reality often interferes. One organization said that the plans were very good at informing senior level staff and directors, but not necessarily having the information trickle down to teams on site. Another thing was that um, information was only notified to staff where it was impacting on businesses. So for instance, this could be that um, the web team was only notified of an incident if they need to update the website, or the conservation team were only notified if it impacted collections, and not vice versa. So recommendations of what we can do now to improve. If we define how and when an incident is communicated as an emergency response, there's an increase in use in digital technology to enable remote assessments as much as possible in early stages, especially for small scale incidences. And this also included a lot more um, interdepartmental collaboration, particularly with front of house and security and first responders. If we defined how and when we escalate emergency response, a lot of institutions were discussing capacity thresholds in order to understand exactly how much collection can be handled internally. Reducing out of our um, staff travel and call outs as much as possible. And again, might come back to this more later when we discuss welfare. And also um, including emergency response plan in induction for all staff. This is particularly important to raise awareness and to manage expectations, what everyone in an organization can expect when an emergency incident takes place. This is particularly useful for public facing services in front of house who may not understand the time frames involved in treating collections or, or areas that may be out of action for a while. So the survey data around access and awareness. The majority of respondents did have one defined location for the current version of their emergency response plan. And more staff could access this one location for plans. The majority of respondents also had a remote access to digital plans, which is really great. And organizations are uh, wanted to ensure that hard copies of their plans were held in accessible locations for emergency responses. And this does mean that it's not always helpful having plans locked away in a desk when you can't necessarily access offices. So it's more likely that it might be kept with a um, salvage kit or in um, first responders bags. There's a lot of um, discussion in the comments and the interviews around using digital technologies to improve our access awareness. Lots of views of Dropbox, SharePoint, um, WhatsApp groups, Telegram. Um, but also in addition to streamlining our hard copies. So we're not continually printing out reviewed and revised plans. Um, a lot of uh, organizations were having what we call pocket plans or very small abbreviated versions or checklists of the, the types of procedures or actions that would always take place in emergency response. And these don't often need to be updated because they don't change. So some recommendations of what we can do now. The current version of the plan should always be held centrally in one fully accessible location. This could be digital and hard copies. For digital plans, it should be held in a high level location. And what I mean by this is we, it's very difficult at the time, especially with remote access, to try to find a plan that's held within a numerous subfolders within a server or potentially somewhere on SharePoint that is security controlled and limited access. And we also need, as I mentioned, need to ensure copies are, are fully accessible during salvage operations. And I would also recommend creating abbreviated guidance or things that can be kept and don't need to be updated all the time and printed out. So the survey data salvage training. Um, over half respondents 
do you have emergency response included in the job descriptions or roles and responsibilities? Over the last year, um, organizations kept in touch with their emergency response staff in different ways. Um, a lot sort of had ad hoc, um, non-routine scheduled meetings. Um, a number used social media channels. So again, that's like WhatsApp groups, Telegram, you know, Zoom, um, Teams um, during lockdowns. Um, interestingly, in terms of staff welfare, and most organizations didn't have a systematic or um, written down way of rationalizing staff out of hours working. And this came out a lot for welfare issues, particularly during lockdowns when um, transport and travel was very limited. Um, it did add a level of stress to um, a lot of people that I, I spoke to. And something that we can definitely look at in terms of reducing, um, reducing that. Um, organizations tend to train their staff more on an ad hoc basis with only just over a quarter of clean, um, regular yearly training. I'm just looking at the training in detail. The main training activities that tend to occur in person pre-COVID were mock salvage exercises. So this would be running through um, a set scenario. Um, tabletop, we might just sit and discuss it in person instead of enact enacting it. Recovery activities, such as moving objects from water and working out how to dry them. And also resumptions activities, you know, how we get things back to business as usual. I was interested to see that just over half of respondents had remote training during lockdowns. And again, the activities were fairly um, um, a little bit different, just based on what we could do. So lots of people were um, re reviewing the emergency response plans <clears throat> and working to increase access and awareness. Reviewing our health and safety and our personal protective equipment was also really high on the list, as well as reviewing roles and responsibilities. So lots of interesting comments um, from the interviews and surveys that I mentioned. Um, a number of people did say hands-on training is the most effective at demonstrating what it feels like to do salvage. Although there are a number of really interesting different ways people were um, using digital technologies to increase training during lockdowns. I was particularly taken by an organization that made a series of short videos, 60 to 90 seconds each, just showing simple tasks like how to set up a wet vac or how to access the salvage kit because it had a particular lock mechanism. And these have now been kept as a permanent refresher, as a resource for the staff to always go back to. And another organization set up uh, monthly um, check-ins with teams and just started going through the 10 agents of deterioration to keep discussions going. So recommendations I've made is always clarify staff expectations for what we would call out of hours calls particularly for non-specialist staff to ask exact, to understand exactly the types of roles and tasks they could be asked to undertake. And I mentioned before, this was this, uh, uh, an area of particular um, anxiety, that non-specialist staff could be the first on site and not feel confident to start the, the process. So streamlining exactly what's asked, having laminated sheets of, of activities, and also knowing when they could be called is really important. Planning regular refresher training sessions for all incident responders should also be a priority. This can include the mock salvage scenarios that we discussed in person, as well as the online videos and materials for reviewing procedures. Um, staff welfare should be a definite priority. It is always mentioned in plans, but I think sometimes reality gets in the way and it's often easy to overlook the long periods of time the staff work in incident response. This was an a, a, a area of, of, of stress. I feel like something that we could um, help alleviate by just planning and uh, um, refreshing and, and, and specifying further. I also think it's really important that we keep all these online training materials that have been made and make them accessible as a, as a database for everyone. And so much useful and interesting innovation has been made in the last year. It'd be such a shame to lose that. So that was my research from over the summer. What does this mean now? How can we act and what can we do? As we know, extreme weather events are becoming more common. Um, this means, of course, that emergency plans are becoming more important than ever. A number of um, historic sites galleries and museums are in areas where flooding and flood risks are ever present. I was really heartened to see that so many organizations are taking action now and have a real desire to change and make improvements. They're no longer just wanting to continue with past practice or business as usual. Remote working has become normalized during the pandemic and I think our emergency processes and procedures are updating to capture this change. There's a lot more um, use of digital technologies and social media to really help people understand and make assessments. I think communication has always become relevant and accessible. You know, call out lists can be streamlined. You know, we can use digital technologies for part of this. 
And remote assessments can be used for first appraisals, particularly with or collaboration with front of house and security teams. Digital technology generally or it can be a tool to help enhance accessibility and communication and can always um, also help us always be sure we have um, access to current plans and training materials. And then, as I also mentioned, training delivered through any digital platform can increase attendance and help create libraries of accessible information for continual reference. Thank you very much. Um, I've just put my email address and my Twitter handle on the screen in case anyone wants to get in touch with any questions or further um, or just informal chat about emergency response and uh, planning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ariel. That was great. I've certainly got some questions to ask you. Um, but conscious of time, we will um, press on to our third speaker so that we can maximise the um, Q&A time that we have left. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Morgan Lurette, who's uh, also appeared as if by magic at the top of my screen. Uh, good morning, or oh, just, uh, just still in the morning. Um, so uh, just to introduce Morgan. Um, Morgan is a book and paper conservator, and she's working at her speciality at the British Library. She's founder and co-chair of the library's Green Network, and her presentation today is entitled Who Makes Glam Sustainable? An Introduction to the British Library Green Network and Professional Agency in the Climate Crisis. Thank Thanks very much, Morgan. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, well, that was a fab introduction, so I'll just tuck in. Uh, yeah, today I'd like to pose the question, who makes the glam um, sector more sustainable? Introduce you to the network and um, yeah, just give you a bit of information on the network, which is essentially the product of me thinking through this very question. So I'll start with what I see as the problem with the capital P, and I'll try my best to articulate how heritage can play a major super positive role in the problem solution, coupled with um, the problematic of this talk, who actually makes the heritage sector sustainable. I'll round things off with a brief introduction and blueprint of the network, some top tips and lessons learned in the past year and a half since we formed, and I hope it'll encourage you to start something similar or even start to think about starting something similar in your own workplace. So the problem with a capital P is that the world in which we live is confronted by a web of interlaced ecological emergencies, which themselves lead to and are exacerbated by a multitude of social crises. We know this is a global issue and we can only mitigate it through global cooperation. While governments hash it all out in Glasgow, um, it's important to remember that cooperation cannot just come from, the from those at the top of the decision-making food chain. All sectors within the government's economies must step up and play a role. And of course, that means us in GLAM. And in case you haven't heard, <laughs> the problem is not only global, but it's also without a doubt human. Um, the latest IPCC report uh, released this summer, which represents the world's scientific knowledge to climate change uh, on climate change to date. Um, they kick us off <laughs> with the tagline that is designed to leave nothing to the imagination. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. This might rightly freak you out and or call you to action. I hope it's mostly the latter, and if so, you're in very good company. Back to us in Glam. While the heritage sector faces plenty of specific risks arising from ecological issues, our sector also contributes major problems of its own. Our core twin uh, missions are the preservation of cultural heritage and facilitating accessibility to those collections. These operations are intensely energy and resource hungry, and the images on the slide demonstrate it. On the left, you see an example of plant systems that work hard to keep our internal environments dry, cool, and in specific temperature and humidity ranges for material preservation. On the right, you see an example of an exhibition space in the British Library. Now, even this particular gallery, which is the permanently built Treasures Gallery, produces waste from set building, of course, but multiply that by the waste generated from our own annual schedule of temporary exhibitions that need to be built up and kitted out nearly from scratch. Multiply this by the sectors, exhibitions and loads programming. That's a lot of waste in the name of access. And these footprints themselves, of course, are significant, but my God, can heritage also play a significant role in addressing the ecological and social crises of the day? So heritage, we connect people to their histories, to their cultures, to their own communities and archives and libraries, we're keepers of collective memory and we're dedicated spaces for learning from that collective memory. And we're trusted storytellers which, with enormous power to drive change. 
Oops. That has nothing to say of our duty as stewards for other people's heritage, be it local or national. So with this in mind, I firmly believe that we should not be working so hard to preserve our cultural heritage at the sake of our natural heritage. And these were the thoughts swimming in my head when COVID forced me away from my day job. I went down the rabbit hole, <laughs> the crossroads of, crossroads of heritage and sustainability, and I was ready to do something. So I wrote to the head, um, our head of estates to suggest that his department start something like the Green Staff Network. His response was positive, but unfortunately the recent onset of pandemic left our already straight, stretched estates teams with zero time to progress this idea. So I thought while I wait for him to have the capacity, I'll suggest some greeny actions um, of, in our, that we could do in our own, we could do in my own department. And soon I had colleagues from lots of different departments wanting to join in and we had a green network. A year and a half later, with much more of a mature network on my hands, I can confidently say to all listening that you do not have to wait for the person in charge to do something. And so the question, who makes Glam sustainable? Is it top down or bottom up? Senior management can make the rules, but can they guarantee those rules will filter down to everyday workplace culture? Not likely, especially in large institutions. Is it bottom up? Staff on the ground can't make institutional rules, but they can do small actions within their own oversight. They can talk and influence colleagues. Um, they can organize and pressure senior management. This is what drives workplace culture, I think. And with that, the support of, some, of senior leadership, that is what can make um, a sustainable heritage organization. And in fact, I don't just think it, I know it, <laughs> um, because that's what's happened in my own workplace with the found, founding and continued success of our network. First and foremost, a real staff-led initiative, but with strong senior management support, we have a simple purpose, make the British Library a more sustainable heritage organization and workplace through staff action. And fulfilling this purpose, we aim to one, empower staff members to find agency in the ecological crisis, uh, challenges of the day, build green or green thinking skills, and take sustainable action in their professional lives. This is incredibly important for me as it can often feel like what we do as individuals is nothing more than a drop in the bucket. So this network is a safe space where colleagues can find actions, volunteer to represent their department, show, or, or yeah, to show up and talk to each other. Um, we aim also to use the momentum of those actions to advocate for sustainable policy at the British Library. This is where the support of senior leadership is key and where your initiative um, becomes a stakeholder in its own right. And thirdly, we aim to communicate our journey as an organization internally and externally. Now the Green Network did not start the BL, the BL sustainability journey. Um, there have been initiatives for decades to improve lighting, uh, reduce waste, etc. The network aims to be a useful tool for that narrative so that all staff and public are tuned into the journey. Our purpose and aims guide our activities, which can be broken down into four groups roughly, and they all feed each other. Engagement of all is key, and it doesn't mean everyone must be super active members. Rather, all staff, no matter what their capacity for participation, are welcome. We also intend to hold trainings, talks, events, well-being workplaces to combat eco-anxiety, all this to help colleagues engage, not so much with the network in particular, but rather the purpose of the network. And with staff engagement comes staff action. This collaboration is the best part of the network. It's a conscious de-siloing as colleagues work together on actions that affect and require, um, require input from different departments. This is in recorded, tracked and measured in departmental action plans. Actions then snowball into something akin to cultural shift in your department um, or your institution, and that ultimately makes advocating your cause to senior leadership a breeze. For us, we have senior leaders who act as sponsors and in their own right, active members in the network. Um, they then advocate on behalf of the network further up the line to chief officers and to the board. And this all leads to a buzz of communication internally and externally. So our activities help embed sustainability in the British Library, and this has major impact on both staff and the organization. For individual staff, we now have a voice. We are forced shifting our workplace culture to a more sustainable one. The network also provides an outlet for action and community and what is objectively an overwhelming topic, saving the planet. 
and organizationally, the network is evidence that the BL is playing a, an active role, active and positive role in today's ecological crises across the board, top to tail, also a medium for communicating its sustainability journey that leads to connections and collaborations in all directions. For example, me speaking to you today. Combining that action on the ground and the advocacy at the top makes for a truly sustainable BL, or at least it helps to chase the moving target that is sustainability. And wrapping up, these are just some top tips and lessons learned from developing the Green Network so far. The first is I recommend you familiarize yourself with the UN Sustainable um, Development Goals. You can, you can think of them as a common language uh, when, when communicating sustainability issues. Work with and not against your organization's strategy. Use that strategy as a lens for your actions. It's really easy to want to do everything, um, but make sure you keep your network focused with realistic targets and structured by delegating responsibilities. Once you feel empowered, work to empower those around you so that they may engage in ways that they'd like to. Um, and remember that sustainability affects us all. So make sure to keep your efforts successful and inclusive. Remember that it's a journey. You do not have to get everything right um, in the first instance. In fact, learning from and communicating that journey helps others, which ultimately makes the wider goal of sustainable glam quicker to realize. Um, in the beginning, I felt like we weren't moving through actions quickly enough. And I will just say that uh, actually people, colleagues talking about sustainability and sustainable workplace practice is, is the biggest sort of action that you can nail down. So don't get too bogged down with um, KPI. Remember to think in three, as in the three pillars of sustainability, social, environmental, and financial. Um, where what is holistically sustainable is bearable for people and planet, it's equitable and it's viable. And lastly, connect with colleagues in and out of your organization, with the public, with anyone and everyone. And just in case you were thinking, I'd love to do this. <laughs> I am not a sustainability expert. That's no worries. I can say from experience, anyone, no matter what your role, can start a staff network or a green initiative. If you need a little pep talk, look no further than the riveting <laughs> UK government Green Jobs Task Force task force report which states the opportunity for green jobs and skills should not be considered as niche or restricted to certain sectors of the economy. Every job has the potential to become green as the world moves to combat climate change. All you need to get started is courage to start the conversation, a drive to keep the conversation going, and a little bit of self-learning. On this slide I've popped some of my favorite um, resources and organizations. Most of them are free. And like I said a few moments ago, please do not hesitate to connect. Um, we're all in this together and we can't do it without one another. So all that's left to say is thank you very much for listening and many, many thanks to the National Archives for having me. See you at the panel. Thanks very much, Morgan. Oh, that's really inspiring, um, a, a great initiative that you took forward there. Um, without further ado, thank you very much to everyone for, for sticking to time. We've got um, Helen Wilson, who's already started to share her screen. Um, um, so Helen is an icon accredited heritage science a scientist and a preventive conservator at the National Archives. Since 2020, Helen has been taking forward the sustainability related activities of the collection care department, as well as leading the National Archives um, collections emergency plan. So very much um, links to some of the previous presentations we've had. She's She's also involved in document handling training and analytical lab management. Helen is also the National Archives' key contact for the Climate Heritage Network and now for the ICROM Our Collections Matter partnership. Over to you Helen. Thank you Val. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm going to try very hard to keep to my five minutes. Um, so today I'm going to share with you a bit about how the National Archives is acting now uh, going forward to help improve uh, the sustainability of our collection care practices and that will be uh, through the collection care department and also uh, the recently announced partnership with ICRAM Our Collections Matter. Um, as if you were there on Monday with us, um, you'll have seen Jeff James, our CEO and keeper, um, announce and share that we uh, really take incredibly seriously our role in safeguarding collections for generations to come and playing a key role in leading and helping the archive sector uh, to adapt and mitigate our ways of working uh, to achieve a sustainable future and ways that the National Archives as a whole has, has uh, moved towards this already uh, you know we've included uh, sustainability within uh, our latest strategy we have the sustainability and climate action statement uh, and uh, climate heritage network membership and on Monday uh, Jeff 
James announced uh, our recent uh, partnership with ICROM's Our Collections Matter. Um, uh, our Collections Matter is uh, was mentioned actually by uh, Morgan just now in, um, oh, I can't move my screen on, sorry, uh, in uh, her references at the very end of her presentation, which is fantastic. Um, it's a, a really great initiative that already has a toolkit available for uh, the archive sector and wider cultural um, heritage sector to use. It's got currently over 200 individual resources on it and these have all been mapped to the 17 sustainable development goals again which Morgan uh, referenced to really really helpfully. Um, the website is here if you'd like to check it out. Um, as um, a partner the collection care department will be leading this relationship for the National Archives and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that what that will entail. Uh, going forward uh, in a bit but first let me introduce you to the collection care department so we are uh, um, a team of around 35 uh, conservation uh, collection care professionals uh, we work across five different streams so we we have got um, heritage science we have got conservation in the forms of digitization preventive and bench conservation we've also got our loans and engagement streams uh, and uh, very much uh, over the last few years we've been really uh, looking to improve the sustainability of our own activities, the activities that are really directly within our control. So we've, as you've heard um, previously uh, with Mark Sullivan earlier today and also with Sarah Vansnick on Monday, we have been uh, working more widely uh, within the archive uh, to improve the sustainability of the environmental management of our repository spaces. Um, but uh, we're definitely looking to shift towards what we're doing on our day-to-day -day basis, what's in our control that we can make um, most uh, headway on um, and, and quite quickly. And so to, um, to that effect, uh, I have some tips about how we have uh, led to the action that I will talk about later. So we've had this ambition that we want to become a more sustainable collection care department. Uh, how do we turn that into action? The first stage really was uh, including it and this ambition within our departmental strategy uh, because by doing that we've then enabled ourselves to allocate staff time towards it um, and as Morgan um, and nicely referred to you know it, linking to the higher strategies of the organization is really important in this and so it was really great that we already had that in place uh, that there was this senior leadership team um, you know drive for this kind of activity by having this within our strategy which is a five-year strategy we were then able to assess the risk uh, that climate change is poses to our collection. So the National Archives collection very specifically, uh, looking at our site, our building, our collections, and what does that mean from a collections care perspective? And this information then went in to inform uh, a departmental sustainability action plan. And this is a two year plan uh, where we looked at uh, very much, you know, what bits of our activities we feel we need to focus on in the next two years that are within our control. Uh, but even within that uh, action plan for us and what that action plan uh, looks like for us, um, it's still not got to the nitty gritty, who's going to take that forward. Um, and so that's where the annual departmental work plan came, came in. So we've now integrated these, um, these actions into that work plan. So we have uh, people responsible for taking forward various projects uh, and making sure that sustainability is becoming integrated into our into our day to day working. So I think that's been really helpful for us and to date um, have, we've looked at integrating uh, everything as I've just said but we've also then um, focused on communicating our story so far which uh, very much has been around the uh, work on the environmental management of the repositories um, but also our plans sort of going forward and we've uh, focused also on building our networks and to that effect um, it came out of the, the report um, on uh, climate change and the risk that, that poses to our collection, um, we were able to highlight uh, to uh, our exec team about the Climate Heritage Network um, and because they felt that very much did align with uh, the direction they wanted to be going on on a sustainability level, um, you know, they approved membership and so 
in 2020, the same year that we uh, announced our uh, sustainability and climate action statement, we also announced our membership of Climate Heritage Network and they're doing fantastic things as we speak at COP26. And if you're here on Monday, you'll have seen Sarah Crofts talk about uh, an advocacy uh, toolkit that has just been released by Working Group One from, uh, from that network. We had to think very strategically about what networks to participate in. Uh, a further comment from Monday had been that there are now so many, um, how do you choose where to go? Uh, and a really great suggestion was to look at just a few, try to not stretch yourself too thinly. And certainly I've been really excited by a whole range of opportunities that arose. Um, but uh, we, we focused on uh, the Climate Heritage Network, uh, the relationship of which we, we as a department are managing for TNA at the moment, uh, but also ICON, um, the Institute of Conservation's Environmental Sustainability Network, um, because we felt that we could really add value to that and the resources and webinars and uh, opportunities for socials and discussions that they were uh, bringing up were really, we felt really valuable uh, to us and our, our own development as well. And of course then, um, ICROM's Our Collections Matter um, initiative. So the, the partnership then that um, the exec team again approved on. So as a, t as a National Archives corporate partnership, um, you know, this was a really exciting, um, exciting time for us that this um, uh, was uh, seen as valuable um, by the entire of the organization, uh, because very much for us, we're looking at this toolkit uh, that they've produced and, and seeing real value for ourselves uh, as a collection care department in being able to uh, help us to improve our sustainability. But we felt that it was wider than this, that this would be really valuable to the archive sector as a whole and felt it was therefore really important that we'd participated in this and we participated in helping the development of this. Uh, the toolkit is still in its development phase. As I say, it has over 200 resources already. Um, but they're very much um, developing the training that will go alongside this as well. Um, and so this brings us rather nicely to our next steps for um, the National Archives with respect to collections care. Um, and that's very much uh, research. So as uh, partners, uh, we will be taking forward uh, two projects led by the Collection Care Department to improve the sustainability of two areas that are within our control. So we're very much looking at the loans procedures and also the departmental procurement pr practices. Um, so as a partner, what this means is that we will use the toolkit and you see here um, a snapshot of uh, the toolkit uh, when you first go to it, uh, to we'll use the toolkit to find a resource that will help us to create the um, results that we need, give us the information that we need to help improve our practice. If that resource doesn't uh, exist to date, well, that will actually be a very useful uh, point um, for ICROM as well, and we will we'll raise that. So a key part of this partnership is that we will feed back on the process um, so that we can help improve the toolkits for others uh, and to also shape that training. Um, the, uh, I would, Sorry, I would encourage you to, to go and have a look at, at that toolkit and um, a link will be uh, shared uh, uh, by our, our team uh, to a resource by Henry McGee from Curating Tomorrow. Again, it's one that Morgan uh, Lorette had highlighted on her final page, because if there is, um, you know, if you're feeling concerned about how do I relate my archival practice to these sustainable development goals in order to find a resource or well, for the minute I think that resource could really help you in time the training will help um, but my last point to make is that I'm really excited that um, I'm working with the archive se sector development team at the minute to work out how I can actually um, reach um, the archive sector work with the archive sector as well as part of this partnership so we would like to uh, work with archives to trial this um, this toolkit the, the our collections matter toolkit in a field test looking at uh, an archives uh, a different archives um, archival practice trying to improve the sustainability of that and then feeding back to uh, ICROM uh, to help improve that further um, once uh, we have more details, I will uh, certainly be announcing them. But I'm really excited that it gives us an opportunity not only to improve the sustainability here at the National Archives in collections care, but also uh, more widely within the sector. And I hasten to add, not even just in collections care within the sector, with across all of archival practice. This is uh, very much for, uh, for all areas of archival practice as well as collections care. So thank you, Val. Thank you.
Thanks very much, um, Helen. Uh, it was a great way to, to, to round off. We're very short of, of time, so we will go straight into the um, Q&A, if, if you forgive me. So um, apologies, Helen, if I've, if I've swept along very swiftly, but um, there's, there's quite a lot of questions coming through in the chat and in the Q&A. I want to get as many as, as possible in for, the, for our uh, incredible panel to, to answer. We've got five minutes. So a um, couple for Lorraine. Um, one, Lorraine, that I might ask you to, to deal with in the chat, because I suspect we won't have time. Somebody has Ask, could you point them to any um, information about how they find uh, social and sustainable banks? Uh, I can answer that one thing. really quickly. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay, go for it then. That section will be in my book, but I have in front of me now the ethical banks in the UK in 2021 are nationwide Triodos, Monzo, and Starling. In terms of a pension, Lion Trust Sustainable, Sustainable Future Range is recommended and a company called Pension B. Triodos are brilliant. Um, I, have, I have, for the first time ever, wandered into a Stocks and Shares ISA, and they have three funds, and those are the Triodos Sterling Bond Impact, their Global Equities Impact Fund, and the Pioneer Impact Fund. And that's the one I've gone for because that supports companies who are innovators and pioneers in the field of sustainability. So that's actually helping people develop solutions. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that's that, that's given an, an enormous amount of information to the to the question, and many thanks. Um, I've got one for um, Ariel, and also possibly um, for the others. If anyone else wants to chip on in on this, um, with the things like the, the emergency plans, um, obviously, you know, the emergency response plans can can end up being using lots of things like single-use PPE and single-use plastics very quickly. I wonder if that came up, I know, I know you talked specifically about the survey, but are there any ways or, or has that started to emerge as, as an issue, ways in, in which people can make emergency response plans? And I'll, I'll ask Helen if you've got any thoughts on this as well, uh, to kind of bring in sustainability issues to make sure that some of the things that people kind of grab at when there's an emergency, you know, you kind of understand what people do, they need to act quickly, but are there any ways in which we can build in in advance so that people have at their disposal some more environmentally sustainable ways of, of approaching emergencies that perhaps reduce the the use of single-use plastics and that kind of thing yeah i mean i think you're right it's definitely an area where a lot of people in conservation are doing research um i think in terms of emergency response plans um what i've sort of heard and know about is you can get sort of individually assigned PPE. So for instance, if you have a very defined um, emergency salvage team, they could be assigned their own um, fitted mask, in which case you only have to change the filter, not the entire mask. Um, and same with um, protective gear like clothing and boots and footwear. Um, this is obviously far more expensive. And if you have um, salvage teams that have a lot of angels, it's not always um, practical for organizations to to afford to do that um, in terms of other sort of kit that we use on site like things like gloves um, and disposable dust masks I think again this is an area we're looking into in conservation I'm trying to find either um, biodegradable alternatives or ones that we can recycle and encouraging the manufacturers and suppliers to get involved in this with us as a sector because if we're leading as consumers saying that we really want this that our suppliers will hopefully follow suit and help us achieve these goals. But it's definitely something that everyone's really aware of. I'm aware of that on site. I, I was having to deal with a small water ingress and you'd get the um, disposable absorbent pads. And I thought, well, I don't want to use that because I use it once and it's gone. So I literally just got a mop and bucket and was doing the old fashioned way, trying to get as much water out as I could that way. So I didn't want to have to use anything I had to chuck away. <laughs> That, that's that's exactly that's exactly the you know the, the point isn't it so um yeah really interesting Helen do you have any any uh, things to add I don't know whether no you, I think that's um, fantastic that. uh, the only thing uh, being that actually there was a point around this uh, that and uh, icons environmental sustainability network had brought up recently and it was potentially one of the Twitter conferences and I think it's maybe then an ex an area that we could expand further uh, Lorraine would be the best uh, person to ask on that as chair um, but you know it's really great that it is in such discussion and what kind of need is to pull it all together don't we so that everybody and make it really visible of what what is going on and what are the kind of outcomes and um, in terms of the I guess the waste stream aspect of it actually is something that comes up a lot in discussions that it can be very tricky that because it's not necessarily something in your control and certainly you know in the National Archives it's not directly in our control it's an estate's function so having to 
work with um, the different departments to ensure that you can find uh, the most um, sustainable ways for for your waste and, and whatnot. Um, it takes a bit of talking to and, and, and working out, doesn't it, as well? Thank you. I'm going to swing the conversation to a slightly different direction and ask um, Morgan the next question. Um, I wanted to ask about um, whether your Green Network group had considered um, the impact of home working, because obviously in, in, in some ways, you know, everyone's saying, oh, great, there's much less travel, that's a really environmentally good thing, but I saw something at the weekend that said, actually, everyone, instead of having one office where everyone goes in and puts and puts the heating on and they're all in one office, it's really bad in terms of, of heating because everyone's staying in very dispersed homes, everyone putting their heating on. So there's some, and it's a bit like Lorraine mentioned a couple of these things where, where there's a kind of balancing act, you know, is, is one better than the other? Have your Green Network considered issues like that was a slightly unfair question so if the answer is no I, I you know, do do let me know um I don't want to put you in a horrible position but it, it's something obviously um it it's something we're going to have to deal with uh, because it's a new way of working um has, has the green network considered that or is it going to it has not considered that um <laughs> it might be something that we consider I suppose but it I would also um I, I know I can't I don't know I can't remember the figures but I do know um, while everyone wasn't on site at the BL there was also a massive reduction in their energy use um, lighting that sort of thing so I'm not sure if it's always as simple as a direct comparison of course how people travel to work where they're traveling from um, their time I think should also be considered uh so yeah so anyway no <laughs> the, the short answer is no but um thank you for the question <laughs> thank you and I'm going to I think we're running very heavily out of time but I wanted to ask Lorraine um Elizabeth Thurlow uh put a question in the chat asking you about you, the, you mentioned the four r's mm -hmm. um earlier on and she asked if you could comment on on the reduce r in terms of the fact that obviously uh lots of us are, are working in in collections that are, that are growing all the time and and how that Kind of fits with the reduce thing you know should, should we continue to collect lots of material or should we should we be tougher about what we take in i wonder if you could comment on on that i certainly agree with being tougher so yes continue to collect material if it fits with your collections policy but really stick to your collections policy only take that what is going to add rather than something that you're just going to be sitting on a shelf for the next well 50 years and not go anywhere um i worked many years ago was employed in an archive where they had taken in an accession of 19th century state documents and they were 19th century wrapped up in their paper and string they'd come in in the 1950s I worked there in the early 2000s 50 years they'd never been looked at whilst they were in the archive they'd never been looked at since they'd gone into the solicitors in the 19th century you question the value of keeping them there might have been some really important stuff there there might not have been so what I'm also saying is Stick to your collections policy, be ruthless and deaccession. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to um, end the question and answer session there, which is a real shame because there's loads of things like I can't keep an eye on the speaker. So there's, I can see the chat moving at, the, at my right hand, just at the peripheral vision. So there's loads of loads of chat coming in, lots of engagement. Um, but sadly, we are going to, to have to end there. Um, so I'd like to, to give a virtual round of applause to all our marvellous panel. Um, I've certainly had loads more questions now. It was absolutely inspiring. Thank you all um, very much for joining us and giving up your um your time so generously and and sharing um so so wisely as well um so it remains for me to to do the wrapping up um this was the final sadly the final session of the event so it just remains for me to to kind of draw things to a close with some final remarks so first of all i'd like to thank again not only our speakers for today's really great session um but as we come to the end of the event i'd also like to thank everyone um from attend for attending um from the chat we think we've had a attendees um, from all the four nations of the UK, but also from Europe and from Africa. So um, that's absolutely amazing. And one of the great things about online is that it is much easier for colleagues around the world to join us uh, without having to, um, to do so uh, via large um, plane journeys. So we're particularly pleased um, for those of you who've been able to join us. Thank you very much for doing so. Another lovely thing about online uh, is the sharing um, that's happening and we've seen that here as I said I can see the chat still continuing to to flip away on my right hand so I'd just like to say thanks thanks to all of you who've really generously and thought 
thoughtfully shared comments, links, resources, questions, um, all sorts of things in, in such a positive uh, and, and sharing kind of context. Thank you very much. We've also seen uh, the double-edged sword of having more questions that could then could be asked and answered. On the one hand, it's been great to have the interest and engagement, but always a shame for those whose questions remain unanswered because of a lack of time. So apologies um, uh, for those of you who, who didn't, um, whose questions we didn't get around to answering and hopefully there will be another opportunity. Well, I just wanted briefly before we close to highlight some of the themes that have emerged from the event. Uh, so the first of those is, is partnerships and the need for partnerships and, and working together has emerged really strongly as a theme throughout the, the two days. Um, questions were, were asked and Helen has just referred to this about how to navigate all the, the different network networks, initiatives and resources um, out there. So there is something about working together, but there's also, also something about coordination for us all to think about in the future but also about sharing and learning from each other and you we've absolutely seen that um demonstrated really generously and positively uh in this very session so that's something i'd very much like to to keep hold of Another focus has been on advocacy and how a strength of our sector is how its collections can tell stories to win hearts and minds. And it's really important for us to maintain that emphasis on using our collections to tell those stories. We've seen data, evidence and impact come through as very much strong underlying thread. We've seen sessions with some brilliant data and that you can see people's interest in the statistics provided by Lorraine uh, in this very session. And those have highlighted the importance of having that data to prove your point and to really kind of shock people into, into some action. But we've also been alerted um, throughout other sessions as to how challenging it can be to tell exactly what actions have resulted in what reductions and not, not everything can be reduced to, to data. So the storytelling we've just mentioned or some of the initiatives we've heard about in the session this morning. We saw coming through the idea that sustainability needs to be more of an add on but has to be core to everything that we do and all business as usual. And in terms of actions, and particularly in this Act Now session, the importance of being honest about you, what you can and can't control was made both earlier today uh, in day one, but also in, in this session too. But also the flip side of that is not to be discouraged that you can't change the world overnight, not to be overwhelmed, that it's all too impossible. And we've seen uh, in this Act Now session, um, some really concrete and immediate direct examples of what we can do uh, with the power and resources uh, that we have at our disposal and the important message uh, is just is to do it not just to think about doing it but as but actually to do something so as we come to the end of the event i'd like to thank again all of you who've contributed to it presenting attending and behind the scenes and i particularly like to thank those behind the scenes they're not visible on an online event but their um, role uh, and work is really important so i'd like to thank uh, uh, them very much indeed for the hard work that's gone into um, making this event possible that we've seen some feedback in the chat um, and it's all been really positive so very many thanks for that but I know um, those who are working behind the scenes would really value um, your feedback on the event uh, and the survey is going to be circulated uh, by email soon um, and I know people often feel oh not another survey uh, but if you could take 10 minutes to fill it in it would be really appreciated it is the first time that the National Archives um, has run an event like this uh, and it'd be really good to know what worked, what didn't work for you, what you'd like more of, how we could make it more sustainable. Um, so we'd be really grateful if you could spend some time just to, um, to fill that in and, and give us your thoughts. Sustainability isn't an alien concept concept to the archive or conservation professions because the core of, of our work is acting in the service of future generations and thinking about preserving things for the future. And our understanding of what works and what working for sustainability means has enormously changed and expanded uh, owing to climate change and the scale of that task as we've just discussed can seem sometimes overwhelming uh, but pausing for reflection over the last couple of days we've seen that we do have a history of action that we can draw on as well as numerous resources networks initiatives and a generous set of colleagues to support us along the way so we're not acting alone the actions we take will be shaped by our own particular circumstances and contexts. So in the long table this morning, we sought to surface some of the many different positions that can be taken towards supporting sustainability. 
it won't look the same for everyone. And in our final session, we heard about a range of different actions that might fit or work well within your individual settings. And we hope that this has provided some inspiration and some ideas that you might be able to take forward and that you'll be able to leave the session and the event today re-energized and feeling more empowered and inspired to take action of some kind. It's often said that the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts and working together in collaboration, we can all play a part in supporting environmental sustainability. So thank you very much. Uh, let's go forth and take some action together. Many thanks and thanks again for joining this morning.